So I would like to talk a little bit about processing uh, DSLR images, astrophotograph, astro images, let's say maybe, to be more specific. Uh, and there'll be a little bit of introduction and then we'll, I would like to show you how I process images taken by the camera in actual processing session. And hopefully it will work out. <laughs> Actually, that one I already processed. I, I didn't have a chance to get something fresh here last night because I, um, unfortunately I crashed. But uh, so forgive me for using old images. Uh, when you when you start taking pictures, and it's not only the SLR, everything you know, you set up all the equipment. Uh, you polar align, put all the stuff and all the cables on the mount wait for the dark, I mean, then you polar aligned, and then you can start imaging session. And this imaging session involves many more steps than just taking pictures. You need to, first of all, critical item is to focus camera and refocus it as the temperature changes during the night. And it seems to be simple, but uh, I don't know if you have any questions, what you are using for focusing. I, I use Bakhtin of Marsk because that allows to kind of precise, for precise focusing without relying on me looking through the camera. Uh, you frame the target, you set up auto guider on some star next to the, your target, and then you start taking images. You take images of your target, but then you need to take a bunch of other frames which will be needed later for processing. So those include, cal calibration frames include flat frames and so-called flat dark frames, which is an oxymoron a little bit. Uh, bias or offset fra frames, and dark frames. If, if anybody has some questions, please interrupt me because I'm kind of going fast, I, but I don't know. Can you explain what's the difference between bias and flat? So if the, those three frames basically address three, base, three major problems, I mean, which, which will help you to process images. So bias frame, is the frame taken with the minimum exposure in complete darkness, and it basically maps the electronic offset of your camera, of your detector and every, uh, all the amplifiers. Because your camera will give some readout, let's say so many layers, uh, levels of gray in per pixel, in this pixel, and there'll be some differences when you don't expose it to the light and you don't expose for any time. So it's just the, as short exposure as possible to map that basic offset. Then dark frame is basically the same situation, complete darkness, but you expose, you open, the, I mean, you, you activate camera for let's say 15 minutes. During those 15 minutes, there'll be bias plus whatever thermal signal is generated inside the detector. So that's your dark frame. Now, flat frame is the image of uniformly bright object. So basically, twilight sky or a light box. Something you know is uniform all across. Of course, your, what you will get will have some deviations because there are dust, dust particles sitting somewhere on the optics or in the camera. There is vignetting from every lens or telescope. So you will see an even response of the camera to the uniform pattern. Now that tells you how sensitive each pixel in your camera, on your detector, is to the light. Because they should give you the same signal, but they are not giving you. So that you can correct for that lack of uniformness. And the flat dark is basically dark frame taken with same integration time as bright fly, flat. To just remove, because the flat frame will contain offset and will contain thermal signal. So you need to remove them before you get the pure response to light. Uh, and maybe this is a good moment to mention, none of this constitutes noise. None of it is a noise. And sometimes you hear people say, you know, dar you know, this is offset pattern or what you get in a dark frame, that's the noise. It's not a noise, it's a signal. Noise is an uncertainty with which you know that those different signals. So, but because when you take your image of the target, that image will contain offset signal, will contain thermal signal accumulated, regardless of photons coming from space, will con contain an even response. All of it is in that image. And on top of it, there will be sky glow, 
and whatever you are imaging. So you have to, you can then remove those underlying layers and get kind of representation of response to the sky. So once you've done this, then you can move to the next target. And you kind of repeat the same process again and again. Can you do processing without the calibration information? Or is your software like prevented? Or? I mean, you can have a picture without calibration, but that picture will contain all of it. Right. So, so it means the corners will be darker, there will be shadows of the dust, uh, there will be thermal current, there will be hot pixels and everything. It's an image. Actually, that image will contain maximum information. That's all the information which comes to you. But you can do a little bit better if you remove those calibration layers. Calibrate. Basically, you remove the part of the signal which comes from, comes from the instrument, not from the sky. Can you move after the processing? No. Because there are so many steps that if you do them in the wrong order, you can then improvise, you know, you can do Photoshop or something or gradient removal, but this is all improvisation. And it will be always kind of subjective. Calibration will let you do it, remove those things in a predictable and, you know, consistent manner. So you don't have to do gradient removal later or, you know, correct something with the mouse strokes, etc. Makes it, it's a lot easier that way. So uh, very quickly about uh, using the SLR for astro imaging. Uh, uh, first of all, maybe the, the pros. It's a small portable instrument which lets you register image in a digital form. Uh, simple in use, light, easy to attach to the, you know, to, to the telescope. You can expose for a very long time on the B setting. But then there are some cons, unfortunately. First of all, as they come up, they come in the box from the manufacturer with except of these DA models. Uh, they have internal filter in front of the detector. That, that filter kind of evens up the response to daylight, so you can get nicely balanced color pictures. Unfortunately, that filter subdues red end of the spectrum. And that's where the hydrogen alpha emission lies. So all the emission nebulae will be actually imaged quite dark. They won't be giving you enough signal. That filter, unfortunately, that filter can be removed and replaced with the filter which doesn't subdue the red end, then you have more even response. So it's about six to eight fold improvement. So this is, high, this is actually, I th I've taken the spectrum of sun and you see the response in and around hydrogen alpha line. That's the difference between factory filter and replacement filter. And that's basically what the modification, astro modification means. So if you modify a camera, then does that make it useless for a regular photograph? No, you, there are a few ways to deal it, to use it in a daylight. First of all, if you don't do anything and just rely on automatic settings, everything will be shifted toward red. Your images will be slightly reddish. But you can use custom balance, or you can pu put in front of your lens, or in f you can put a filter which actually will mimic the original filter, and will be kind of superimposed on that modified filter. Yeah, and then you, you will have normal settings. There's also clip filter go from astronomy going inside the camera behind the lens, which has the same function, that it will actually restore the original profile. Well, basically it's a filter which will subdue red. Okay. So you can still use it. So either custom balance or, uh, or that filter. So that's one problem of DSLR imaging and if you send it to somebody to be modified or you yourself disassemble it into pieces and replace the filter. Reci I mean, protocols are on internet so if one is uh, interested it's, it's easy to do it. Uh, the other major problem is that the DSLR, of course, is not cooled. It works at ambient temperature. And what it means, there's a lot more dark current because the, the, ma the main reason of cooling, let's say, CCD cameras in astrophotography or in scientific imaging is to lower or actually completely remove dark current. If you cool to minus 100 Celsius, there's no dark current in CCD. That's a little bit tough to, to do at the telescope, 
but if you go every seven degrees uh, down, you go about half in the amount of that current which accumulates. DSLR works at room temperature, so unfortunately you cannot escape from it. And basically what it means that if the bias signal is this blue, blue kind of peak, that's the bias response, you expose in the darkness for a few minutes, you see the red line kind of accumulating this way, you do the same exposure to the sky, there will be all that bias inside, the dark current, and then you have signal, big peak, and you, you think, okay, that's a lot of signal here. Unfortunately, all that peak, that's a sky glow. Uh, and it's hard to see. So what's the x-axis and y-axis? X-axis is the, this is the intensity of the pixel, a number of the pixels, so it's a histogram. So number of the pixels with a particular intensity. This is linear scale, so it's hard to see. If you look at logarithmic scale, you kind of have a better idea. Because uh, now you see that dark current, like five minutes, already gives you some pixels. This is about, this is one pixel, and you see there are pixels already which saturate the camera. It's about actually a few hundred pixels which were, were completely saturated, completely white, in the absence of any light. If you take astro image, so dark sky background, that's that part of the peak, and all your stars and these sky objects are represented by those pixels. And there are some stars which are so bright they saturated even more pixels. So there's about whatever, 100,000 pixels which are completely saturated in this image. Um, so you have to deal with that. You have to remember that there's high dark current, which means the processing will be so criti more critical because you are dealing with images which are, look grainy. Uh, but important thing to remember is you would like to avoid warming up that detector even more. By, and how do you, can you warm it up? If you look at this, to this tiny screen on the back of the camera, how does my image look? <laughs> you know. <laughs> Then you are warming it up. It's actually getting worse and worse. There will be more and more dark current because the, the electronics will warm up the detector. One way around it is to use the external small monitor, and that will take some heat away. But still, there will be heating every time you kind of activate the preview electronics. Even. So, and there will be different problem, of course, in Florida when it's warm at night, and somewhere in northern Canada when it's cool, a lot cooler <laughs> during the same night. And and the final uh, problem uh, associated with using the SLR is presence of Bayer array. Bayer array is basically, basically in DSL, DSLR is a color imager. So each pixel, ev ev every individual pixel samples only particular color in the image. And there, basically there's a, a grid of colored masks on the pixels. So there'll be a pixel which will detect only green light, followed by pixel detecting red light, green, etc., and the next row there will be blue pixels. So there are twice as many green pixels, green sensitive pixels as red and blue. Uh, because pixel detects only particular uh, wavelength, particular color, and ignores their other, and they are kind of put it on, they are present as the checkerboard pattern. This complicates calibration. And the way to deal with it, you, s you have to do you have to keep that information, that spatial color pattern, until after you calibrate. If you, if you convert Bayer array image into color image, which basically will look at the pixel and average the color over it, then it's almost, it's very difficult, I, I mean, it's impossible to calibrate. One can try to avoid major problems with it kind of, but it, it's then, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of trying to patch the bad job. Uh, so, we have to figure out the way to process DSLR image as a buyer array, not as usual color RGB image. So there, this is the processing scheme I'm using. I call it recommended, but <laughs> of course, sometimes they have, to, they have, they have, there are some other problems. I try to show it like this. Can I? So there are four steps uh, included. No, I cannot do this. First, at the camera, what you need is to acquire images as a raw format. 
So you have the 12 or 14 bit uh, files because they contain more information. If you, if you acquire them as JPEG or TIFF, uh, then the buyer array is already gone. It's already, uh, color is averaged and you cannot process it, it, it. And usually they are also scaled in brightness. And when you acquire those calibration frames, it's nice to use the flat source, source, light source for flat, which kind of matches the response of your pixel. It makes it a little bit easier, but it's not necessary. Then, if you had, I, I understand there are a few different uh, software packages which we can let you process buyer array as, as that checkerboard. What I'm using is actually freeware called Iris. So it's freely downloadable and it's very powerful. And I found it actually very fast and easy to use for the calibration part. Uh, in Iris, you can open your raw image as the image and then you lose the buyer array. So you have to actually load it as a buyer array. It's a special command for that. Then you combine your bias frames into master bias frame, dark frames into master dark frames. You create a list of the hot pixels because, as I mentioned, DSLR is such a warm detector. There's so much uh, thermal current generated. Some pixels are already saturated, so you have to deal with them at some moment. They will be always black because after removal of the, of the dark current, there will be just black hole in this place. Uh, but having a list of them will let you later on deal with those missing pixels. Then you combine flat images, combine also dark flats and remove dark flats from the flat and that will give you master flat. So basically, first one is a, by combining many frames, you basically improve the definition of the signal in a given calibration frame. So you have less uncertainty, therefore there will be less noise in the end. So as many as possible. 10,000 is better than 100, but 100 is better than 10, and 10 is for sure better than one. <laughs> so wherever the limit of the sun, your sanity you know, lies, you can, you can go. <laughs> I settle usually at 11, and 11 because I don't like number 13. <laughs> and 15 seems too many. <laughs> So uh, all the co combining basically leads to lowering the uncertainty and therefore lowering the noise in those master frames. And then each individual deep sky image is processed as this equation shows. You take raw image, r remove bias, remove thermal signal. Thermal signal is dark signal after subtraction of the bias. And then divide by flat map. Uh, flat I don't know if, okay, I won't go into that detail. The flat image is actually just shortly, it's not an image, the flat frame. It's actually a map. It's a map of the sensitivity of each pixel. So you, div you, you take raw, subtract bias, subtra subtract thermal, divide by flat, and if you're left with the image which still has some pixel mis pixels missing information because they were hot. So you can now correct hot pixels. Usually that's done by averaging information from surrounding pixels and putting in that place. It can be median com uh, averaging or just straight uh, mean. Then each, the image which you get is a calibrated image, but it still exists as a buyer array pattern. So then now you can convert it finally into RGB. So you see, if you image, if you acquire your images and as RGB files in the first place, as JPEG or TIFF, you cannot do those things because you are already here. You cannot go back to a buyer array. So once you have each image calibrated as calibrated and saved as the fits RGB file, then you can split each image into R, G, and B color layer, color channel, and save all of that separately. Now there's still so many files. Then I move to AIP for Windows, which I will use those separated, but still individual images to register, combine into master color channels. I can add those master color channels into, to get luminance lay, uh, layer, which can be then processed. Can apply scaling to color uh, channels, R, G, and B, uh, and B. It's important point here is that 
because those will be used to create the color image a little bit later, you can apply only linear scaling. You cannot do gamma log or something because that will throw the color balance off. And then luminance layer and color, scaled color layers can be combined into astro, color astrophoto, which then can be moved, I don't know, into Photoshop or something else you prefer and further processed. I, I like using LAB color space because it gives you additional flexibility. And then you can you know, remove maybe the still, you want to polish the noise, uh, apply local tone mapping, etc. So that's very long introduction, sorry for that. But we can now try to maybe process some images. They were acquired at Winter Star Party with 80 millimeter uh, refractor and modified Canon camera. Uh, as you can see here, it was warm there, so there's a lot of thermal signal in those uh, images, and the, therefore there will be quite a bit of noise to deal with. What temperature do you consider cold or cool enough? Like cold winter night or liquid nitrogen? I mean, <laughs> I usually, I mean, not, not on the telescope, but not every day I work with cameras which I cool to minus 100. For so that's cold. Minus 30 is kind of cool. <laughs> this is definitively, you know, a lot of uh, light. At minus 100, you don't have thermal signal at all. You need to expose for thousands of seconds to get one electron of thermal signal. At minus one? Minus 100. Oh, so you ever do anything like that yourself at home? Home? You, you could. I mean, you would have to drag your, you know, power line probably because you, uh, this is done with the camera which has like three, Triple is a Hamamatsu EMCCD camera, which has triple stage cooling and a big sink, which is cooled. It's a better water circulating to water cooler, and this is no, no, it cannot be done on on on, on the SLR. Some people build like small cooler boxes on them. I think they work. This a thing. Of course, you have to haul more equipment. At that moment, you may go as well to, you know, CCD. Oh, that's the man. Got 24 C seventy-five. So oh, okay. <laughs> I, I'm thinking on our average night out here, we pretty much are well below 75 degrees. Oh, here it's a lot cooler, yes. Yeah, so this, is, this is Florida. This is Florida. Yeah, awesome. Beautiful yeah, observing. Awesome. But unfortunately, not so good imaging because, because of the warm weather. Yeah, I know. On, on your Canon, is there a way to turn off the on chip amplifier during long exposures? Not on that one. Not on that one. So that one will have, you will see actually glow. Uh, which are there, are there some uh, DSLRs that turn off here? No, some of them have it suppressed. I think newer models, this is, uh, I'm using 350D, so it has quite significant glow. Newer models have it suppressed. If the temperature, if you process properly, actually some, if the temperature between your darks and your images didn't change more than one degree, mm -hmm. it will get removed. It will, it will, it will go, be gone still, after dark. But you're still getting a noise from it a little bit, but the, you won't have that donut kind of sticking partially over the edge uh, because it's basically seen as a dark current by the camera. So as long as the temperature didn't change, which sometimes it's not uh, so easy. And that's a, an important point about dark frames is you need to take them at the same temperature, temperature. at which you took your lights. Right? Yes. And so if you take your lights in the middle of the night and you're at something like the Texas Star Party, where you go from 40 degrees at night to 8 in the day, you can't take your darks a day. You've got to take them right after yeah. you get back. But the beauty about darks, if, if you write down temperature at which you took a particular set of dark frames, you can reuse them for images taken at the same temperature later. Be so you, you know, if you spend many nights acquiring just, you come to here, here like last year and it's always cloudy, then you can, you know, spend four nights taking dark frames <laughs> and if you have different, <laughs> different ranges of temperatures, <laughs> temperatures, you can have a library. <laughs> or you have a small cooler in your basement. <laughs> was the only use of it. <laughs> Uh, I would say one or two degrees. You would like to be kind of close, yeah. And you know, if sometimes if you if it's a little bit off, then you know you you'll have some 
uh, remaining thermal noise there. Yeah. Yeah, as, as you're taking, say, out here, the temperatures might be continuously declining, so the first pictures are going to be. Mm -hmm. Yes, and you don't have too much control over it, yes. Yeah. Uh, and also, when you, you checked on your little screen how it looks, and you, the next, your next 15 minute exposure will be probably throw away because it's a lot, the detector is a lot warmer. It's not the temperature of the air, it's the temperature of the detector. Okay. And only, probably only second 15 minute exposure will be good, et cetera, et cetera, you know, what, so. What about if you ovenized your, just put a box around it to, to, to stabilize the thermal? Yeah, if, if, the, if, the, if there's a you know, feasible way of doing it. You can also have, like if you have dark stack in a different temperatures, you can take, you know, let's say you, you were, a, it was 15 degrees. Celsius, <laughs> I operate only Celsius, sorry. <laughs> and you, were, you have frames, dark frames from 18 and 12, you can just average it and you know, it will be now at 15, so you can kind of play it that way. Okay, so if you get a There's some flexibility. selection of dark frames, five degrees, you could then average them. Mm -hmm. probably yes, yes, and then you can, you can get, because the thermal current actually scales with the temperature, and that's the only difference during those, in between those frames. Now, um, if you take your dark frames, uh, they need to be the same duration exposure? As you your image. Okay. Though not necessarily. They can be longer because you are ex in that equation when you are subtracting thermal frame, it's a thermal signal, thermal part of the dark frame. That also scales with, temp that scales with temperature and with time. So if you have longer dark frame, you can, you know, just use fraction of the thermal signal present in it. Though it complicates a little bit, you have to kind of, you know, then introduce additional factor. Can you also do that independent of the temperature? Can you take like a set of like 20 minute dark frames, like maybe 20 or 30 of them, and then just scale it? Um, to try and find a good match? Yeah, the thing is, the thermal signal is not linear and each pixel behaves a little bit differently, so it won't work. So you need to, you, you can average something which is close, you know, on one side and the other, but if it's kind of only one temperature is far away, then some pixels respond, give very strong uh, thermal signal, but they go down very quickly as it cools. So the temperature dropped a few degrees, they, they disappeared, yeah? It's not, it's linear with time, it's proportional, it, it kind of follows the temperature, but it's not linear response. And each pixel behaves a little bit differently. So uh, majority of them are similar and they're kind of linear, but there are those troublesome pixels which have a completely unpredictable behavior. Uh, what about taking uh, the frames this year and two years from now? Is there going to be a change for the aging of the antiprosome? You won't see that, those effects on DSLR. On scientific cameras, yes, they are, because they are so sensitive when they are hit with cosmic ray, sometimes they flip, uh, pixel can flip. So uh, on DSLR, you will never see it. It's also a calibrated set of dark frames that are fairly long. If you did it like every five degrees, then you'd have something that you could reuse. For you can reuse it next year and the year after that, yes. Yeah. So first of all, let's maybe, I, I I'll show you where uh, I can find it now somewhere so this is practice no this is the one here so those are images take which we'll look at we'll try to process and you, you say okay this is a set of images taken of horsehead nebula with this and you right away you know because i will have to focus i look at the i i looked at the monitor even if it was external still the electronics warmed up you see that the first frame is kind of brighter. So it's throw away. That's because of the war additional increase in temperature of the detector. How long then these images? fifteen minute exposures and they are auto guided. So yes, it looks the worst because uh, the detector was still still a little bit warmer and then it cooled down and the rest of them look similar. I'm using you know, an ex external monitor. External monitor, but still warms up enough. Okay. Yeah, and then it cools down. So this is the image. You, I, I would okay. I will throw away the first out of six and use other five. And this is the image as it came from the camera, shown in Kodak software. So this one already averages Bayer array, 
So, it, and you see, you know, there is some signal there. There's horse hair, there's flame nebula, some stars, some of them bright. But you see scattering of those pixels all over. There's like pepper and you sound. Using refractor. Refractor. Yes. What are, what are the, uh, I, I find that with the refractor, when you take the image, the stars end up as this completely boring round blobs, especially bright. I mean, there's no life in them. It's it's kind of boring picture. Uh, I put two thin wires <laughs> across, <laughs> and that will throw in diffraction spikes, and it, I think it looks a little bit more interesting. <laughs> That makes that, that gives, and you can put more than two. So you know, if you could put put three of them, you have six spikes. And it's so popular to do. There's the Adobe Photoshop plugin will do that for you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, plugin doesn't. You know, it has also the other function. When you have those spikes, and then you process your, your images. If your camera lost focus in the meantime, and you didn't notice it while you're observing, at least now you are warned because those spikes will separate, you, they'll be double. And you say, okay, went out of focus. Try again another so like clear night. It's a permanent bottom-off mask in the front Yes, of the yeah. <laughs> <laughs> also, those images are taken through CLS filter, which is a broadband uh, filter, which kind of lets you achieve final white balance for on stars reasonably well. Let's through hydrogen alpha and oxygen three and hydrogen beta emissions, but suppresses sky glow in between those bands. So that's why 15 minute exposures, exposures are possible. Without CLS filter, yeah, probably five or seven minutes would already saturate. I was going to ask how you did that, because I, I do five minute exposures and I get a white frame. Yeah, <laughs> that's what you end up. CLS will suppress. It's mainly sky glow, that big hump in the beginning on the histogram, that's what really kills, and you know, it gets bigger and bigger and saturates. So by, with CLS, you kind of suppress that glow. And it's not just sky pollution, of course it will help with sky light pollution, but even in a dark place like here, there's always glow of the sky. So the pictures look like this, and you know, uh, at least gives you an idea how it looks, but this is not a Barre array image. Uh, Use bar, uh, to see by bar array, I will open it uh, it's somewhere here, I think. That's Iris, right? Yes, I, I'm opening Iris. Uh, and I will try to see if I can find actually where my, um, my file is somewhere. But at this moment, I'm opening it as RGB. So iris, this is just straight open in iris. It opens color image. And there's not too much to see here, mm, uh, other than if you do maybe logarithm scaling. And then you see. So this also displays RGB Im image. like. Canon software, but this one doesn't scale brightness in the same way, and you see how weak the signal is from the dark sky, and how strong those thermal pixels are all over. But this image is still, this is already RGB image. You have already color averaged. So you cannot use open, basically open co load command to see buyer. You need to use load raw file in iris. Is that what you just did for that one? The previous one was just straight load. load. Okay. Now I'm, I'm going to, uh, op, uh, to load. Okay. So first one, which is a wrong way, it's load. But then you use load a raw file. And that will open it as a buyer array. So I will open the same one. Okay. We don't see too much. I think it is a, yes. Should be a different box somewhere here. See? Yeah. We'll do it. Logarithm again. Now we can see it. Because the signals are so low, it opens as 15 bit. 
So you see now, same image as a bar array array. It's even harder to see where the horse head is. <laughs> but the, the important part about uh, Bayer array is that now you see individual pixels. And I, I'll try to find horse head somewhere. It should be somewhere here, maybe. But anyway, I cannot find it. Oh, oh this, is, this is diffraction. <laughs> Just to throw, <laughs> to confuse. <laughs> what you see here is now that everything is gray, and they're just pixels which are brighter. And they are not depicted by color. It's just pure intensity regardless of the color which was detected. The color can be still reconstructed by knowing the number of the pixels. So pixels can, it can you know, position of the pixel, you, know, you can figure out later on the color out of it. But at this moment, you have pure intensity. So you see as each star is depicted. And now this is the image you can, pro you can process, actually. Yeah, that's, uh, I'm assuming that's a well-focused image. Yes. So where we see a star, that represents the actual number of pixels which are covered by a well-focused star. Is that right? Yes. It's so about any, indi any individual bright so this is, let's say, this is, this is star, and this is noise. This is the pixel, which was in some color, but this pixel was warm, giving more thermal current than other pixels. And you also can see here is a part of emission nebula. I think this is part of flame. And you see, because this one has a color shifted one way, you see the checkerboard even. It's not random it's here. Red. It's mainly red. And in the sky, dark sky, actually, checkerboard, between those brighter, you know, brighter thermal uh, pixels, the checkerboard is kind of more even. So this would be the, the image to, to process. So the same way if you open, uh, you can actually notice a, this is, I, think, I believe this is a dust donut here. It's, a, it's hard to see on the screen. But you basically have the response of your camera. So basically to uh, process those images, we need first to I think we have to end up in 15 minutes. Uh, I don't think there's a fixed. OK. 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 So basically, the first, uh, I'll, I'll skip this one. When you now, uh, that's how the image looks. Now we have to go back and say, OK, we first need to prepare calibration frames. And for that, in a digital photo menu of Iris, you have the deco decode raw file. And basically, this allows you to get, uh, if I find my, opens the window to which into, you can drag all the picture, all the images you want to decode. And we start probably, uh, I already sorted images. When camera, of course, outputs them, it saves them as image number, et cetera. I already sorted them into dark, flat frames, et cetera. So first one to process is offset. There are 11 offset, again, not 13, offset images. And if, if you dump them here, then you, I, we give it a name, B for bias. And CFA is basically color uh, filter array. It's a, bi a different acronym for Bayer array. Uh, and I already have the pro, uh, like preferred uh, folder set up on hard drive, which you have to do in Iris. So if we process it, we'll go make them all, take them all and convert all those raw images into a Bayer array. I mean, it will basically preserve them as Bayer array without the possibility of changing into color. So now in Iris, uh, I lost one window. There's another one, see which I lost. It's probably hiding behind. <coughs> so to show you how this one looks, I, I will do this logarithm scaling so it, it kind of brings the 
uh, that doesn't help. So that's basically bias frame. It's kind of uniform, but there are some changes in it. And what we want to do, we want to combine them as an offset file, and I have them, okay. Okay, sorry for that. So you're just zooming out, and you just add those, so there's... This is zooming out, yeah, that's, that's the, the, main, the main one. Oh, you when I add them to, it's just the display. Oh, it's it, it, yeah, it, it, it's being fooled. Uh, let me check because I think I changed the wrong file. So this, uh, okay, F, D, S, it should be B1, okay. Yeah, wrong name. So basically it will, uh, it will median combine all of them. Uh, if I can only find the select images, histogram, plot. <coughs> something which disappeared on me, unfortunately. But this is combined, all of them combined, so I just save it as offset. Okay, let's do it. And we don't need this. So that, that took care of the bias frame, and if you want to see how it looks, again, it's now more uniform. But there's still some variation in it. Then the next one is basically uh, to process uh, dark frame, and those are dark, those are dark frames acquired for 15 minutes each. Again, so they are long darks. Uh, there are not 11 out of them, even if I wanted to. Um, Start this one maybe because maybe I will re regain the block now. So um, dark frame. If we now open it, now you see the dark signal. It's not uniform like bias. You have brighter pixels, and some pixels like this one are completely white. It's saturated. Yeah. So when uh, Iris takes your raw images and combines them like this, it actually switches them to 15-bit space. So it says 15-bit fits files, which are a little bit awkward because they are not usual 16-bit, they are 15-bit for some reason. But uh, you start from 12-bit files anyway, so you don't lose information that way. So once we have all the dark files uh, convert, converted into CFA, now we can make a dark. And it will ask, okay, I just want to make sure that I have the same name. Mm, where's the offset? I don't think I saved the previous one. OK. Sorry, I have to backtrack because I didn't save this one. So now I'm taking, uh, I'm making dark frames, uh, and there were only six. Uh, 
So you can see you can have, you, you can add them up, you can have mean or median, whichever. I'm, I'm using usually median. Uh, what will happen now, it will, have, it will median combine those dark frames which are converted and subtract offset. So actually it will generate thermal file. Is that a script you created or is that a built-in script? It's built-in, yes. Okay, I, I'm again. But is there a way you can uh, automate no. the process? Because it's just a tiny bit too uh, Now, uh, not really. But you have to remember this is just to generate the calibration files. Later on, when you calibrate your image, it actually goes automatically. Yeah. It gives a different name, so that's, that's another thing. No. <coughs> so it created 900, basically master dark now. So it's mainly me being rusty, uh, and I have to make sure. Yeah, it, it has FIT file name, but then it looks for fits, so that's why the problem exists. Okay. So I have to go back and change the uh, f file extension. It has, the iris has few problems like that. Yeah, the file names are kind of, and then it doesn't recognize it. Uh, okay, it will be, and then just to save space, I can get rid of the individual files which were converted, keep just masters. So be a little easier, for, make it easier for me to find it. So those, we took already uh, the offset and dark frames. Now in iris, we want to generate the list of hot pixels which are there, even we cannot see them because I, I missed one window. So this, uh, this is a line command. Uh, and where is it? You have to type the command, but it's, yeah, it's somewhere there uh, in behind. I cannot see it. I think it's a matter of different size of the screen now. I will skip that part. You can basically, uh, it's hiding somewhere off the edge of the screen, unfortunately, so I cannot find it. It's the second one hiding somewhere. Uh, we'll, we'll then skip. There's a command which lets you, it will look at the, uh, software will look at the dark frame, master dark frame, and it will look for the pixels above particular threshold and generate a list of it. So that's what you can use to, to, uh, to correct. I cannot find it, it's somewhere off the edge of the screen, unfortunately, to restart it so it will be longer. So uh, then we need to make a flat field So there's a list of flat, uh, bright, but I first of all take dark. Actually, I, would, I need to use, to use this one. Okay. Well. Just do it. Was it that fast? Okay, I think click the right one. Just out of curiosity, uh, what are the specs on your laptop for CPU and RAM? You know? I mean, I don't want to be no, it's fast. It's fast. It's fast. 
but on a slower one, it won't take very long. Uh, so am I done with this? I will also take, uh, you can, with flat frames, you can have flat darks, which I have here, or because they're short exposures, like 130 or 160 second, you can use offset, actually, because there's really not too much dark current within 130 of the second. So uh, let's, maybe let's do that here. Uh, I, I will make a shortcut. So if I have numbed, uh, they are decoded already here as files with F, there are 11 of them. I can just use them and I use offset in this case to make it a little bit faster. Just myself get in the offset, uh, 11. It will normalize flat to the particular value. It's, in this case, it will normalize to, so it will find the peak and multiply or divide to have 5,000 uh, in a peak. Uh, it's just the normalization of the of, of, of to have a better. You cannot do it at value 100 because then everything will be so coarse. Uh, you know, you you will be actually making more damage to the image than help. Okay. Hmm. It crashed on something. We'll see what it has here. No. Probably the file was too low, okay. You won't succeed in this. Anyway, once we go through this, then uh, so you basically assemble those, those images like that. Uh, I have them already assembled in a different place, if I can find them. That may make it easier. So those are already made files. I, I will use them. <laughs> so we basically have previously assembled offset image, uh, flat image, dark image, uh, and then dark uh, pixel correction, basically hot pixel list. They are in peak files, unfortunately, so that, that complicates its different format. But let's see if I can still use them. Uh, it's a file Iris uses instead of FTS, and maybe that's why I, I usually use peak. In this case, I, I switch to FTS, and maybe that's why I'm running some problems. <laughs> Uh, but we'll try to use them now. So now the next step will be to correct your images. So if we go and we load, we decode basically images of horse head nebula. Mm. Is it here? Yes. So those are images of the nebula itself. And I remember that the first one was no good, so I, I will skip it. I think it may have. It's it's not, uh, you know, it still works under uh, Windows 7, luckily. <laughs> uh, it's pretty robust, but yeah, the, the, the file, num you know, how long it is, it, it has. So you kind of use symbols. And also, like, I guess those, those are files which you use for a moment. You can then just throw them away. You don't, you know, this really, no use of keeping them, and they they getting they are getting huge, and then you know you have tens of gigabytes of temporary files in your folders, and you know they all have strange names and numbers. It's hard to look through them. But this is basically the image 
uh, decoded image of Horsehead Nebula, and uh, it's already scaled in brightness to, uh, to lo logarithmic, so you kind of see, and you, you have all those pixels. So now we can actually do pre-processing on those images. And why is it fits? Okay, here it is. Okay. I will open actually pick file because it's showing me fits file which doesn't exist actually. Yeah, this is pick. It's getting confused with file extensions somehow. So this is pick file. So now we can actually pre-process it and remove bias, thermal, and flat layers and here it's there is some automation so we don't have to click on every step um, so basically if you put your this is hh dash which basically the uh, the file the name of the raw image offset is the name for the uh, bias frame uh, i will try to get other names So this is Dark 900, that's the name. Flat and cosmetic file, I think it's Cosme. But let me check. It's called cosmetic file, but it's basically a list of, flat, uh, of hot pixels. And output, we put, uh, I don't know, HHC for calibrated. Uh, doing with the cosmetic? It's a list of uh, hot pixels. So those pixels, even in the dark frame, dark images were already yeah. saturated. And it's called the average It will, well. it will uh, calculate average of, so when you, pro when you calibrate, there will be basically zero value pixel at this moment because whatever it was in the image, it was already saturated in the dark, there's zero. So it will look now on the pixels around it and average and put, replace that value into it. So, uh, where it crashed, now when I tried, I, I need to select the, Im the area where it will actually optimize conditions. So that's the part when actually it will look. Maybe my, my dark frame was taken at a little bit different temperature. So the values of the pixels are kind of don't follow. So it will look at variation in dark frame and the variation of the image in this kind of relatively dark region of the image and say, okay, I need to scale it by 0.9, let's say. Uh, so that's, but for that it needs to be one-to-one -one display. So I just need to select. There may be some stars, but not very, not you know, bright. So once the region is selected, and then I go back and do pre-processing. Now it knows where to look for the optimi optimization, and we'll go. And it takes this long. It does bias, thermal removal, and correction for frame and corrects also dark pixels, and it's done. So uh, all of... It's done? It's done. So you, what you will see, HC images, those are images which are calibrated. That's why I'm using Iris, not AIP for Windows, even if I have live AIP for Windows, because it will take me probably two days to do this in AIP for Windows. Well, <laughs> I use Pixinsight for I mean, everything calibration through final production. If, if I had five lights, 10 darks, and you know, 20 bias, something like that, it would take probably 30 minutes to go from beginning to uh, calibrated lights. So that's the advantage of Iris. It's like incredibly fast. I mean, this is fast computer, but even on my home, my own home um, laptop, it's just like five times slower. It takes like, you know, it's basically as fast as it can display. It's done. Uh, so this is now the image, which was again displaying logarithmic scale. But you see, the background is still peppery. But that's now mainly uncertainty of the how well you define signal in the dark sky. Sky, the hot pixels are gone, warm pixels are gone. Those thermal signals. There's no vignetting in the corner. You can, uh, you know, 
uh, if I don't know if this will display because I'm missing one we know this is now equilibrated image which you know is the harshest process impossible and the corners are not dark there's no major problems with the image so that's basically the image you would like to take yeah? so uh, this image now I will do it on this it will look like but you, you'll be able to okay maybe I will go now I'll go back to the previous one step further uh, back so this is again uh, I need the logarithmic scale this auto scaling box here, but again, this one dropped off the edge of the my uh, screen here is shrunk by the uh, projector. So this is the image. That image is still a Bayer array, basically image, but it's 15 bit information per pixel. So now you can go next command. You kind of follow that digital photo from top down. You can see you know, parameters of your image, you decode, make offset, make dark, make flat. You can remove this, do it on individual frame, or you can just do pre-processing on the series as we did, like you know, five seconds. So now I want to see color in it. So I convert CFA image. Convert CFA and means it will convert into RGB. I'll do it on one. You can do it on a series when it will do all of them. So that's how the color looks. It's hard to say, but now you basically have RGB image. And to process them all, you basically select sequ sequence conversion, and which had HHC, there were five images, and we put uh, HHCC, whatever. And in, you can convert as black and white or color, whatever. So if you do this, you will take again. This is a little bit slower, but still. Deburying takes a while. I've been shot. Yeah. Now. It's done with all five of them now. Yeah, that you, you see those files. Um, so now, once we have them, then we say, OK, sequence separation. I, even if you know, I have a color here, image. Oh, maybe too small. I want to now have red, green, and blue separate, so then I can uh, align them. So we go and we say basically do sequence RGB, and you just need to, uh, HHCC, and here we call them, uh, I guess like this, simplest way. And we'll basically save them into, uh, I should probably display this as a list. So you have five B uh, blue layers, five red, five green layers. All the images are, are, are there. Um, so that's the end of processing I do in Iris. Uh, this, after that, I will go and I will take those images into AIP for Windows. Uh, and basically do registration on all of them. Uh, because I had to use PIC file, I, I need first manually convert all the PIC files into FIT, so I'm not going to do it here. But I think you know the registration itself, everybody knows how it, how it goes. Yeah? So you basically you take, pick up one, you have the list. In, in IP for Windows, you can select, in multi-image, you can select auto process deep, deep sky tool. And then you can basically select files you want to convert from the list. I'm not going to do this here, and then save them as individual files in a folder. So you can have, you can select all green, blue, and red together. Pick one as a master. I usually pick up one from the middle of the series, so it'll be number three. So the shifts will be equal on both ends, and then basically all of them will get registered, and all of them will be together. So you will have set of blue, green, and red, all shifted to overlap, but kept separately. So uh, I don't know if prob probably that's, you know. That's where I got lost. Two stars, yeah, it picks up two stars. You have to select them, right? You, you have to select them, yes, the on star. On each. Yeah, I probably do it on maybe instead of doing it on a computer because uh, 
But basically, you look at the image. And it will, you know, there'll be some stars. And you select one star, select second star, someone on the other side. And then it goes to the series, and you can, I manually, I usually, if there, there are not too many shifts, with auto guide, that's usually the case, you can do it fully automatic alignment. Mm -hmm. Or you can manually each image, click on it, just to make sure. And that way you can also reject the image, which is, you know, moved or whatever. Right. You don't like it for some reason. And it will go to the series and create now aligned images. Well, I don't know, maybe. Is there interest of going through it, or we uh, maybe skip this part? Yeah. Yeah. Next time. But if yeah. if you want, okay, we can go later. Yeah. Yeah. So basically, uh, I, I'll move quickly to the end. Um, Once you have those, actually I will use it to open them. So once you have them aligned, then you can actually, uh, because I have them here already. For some reason I kept them, did I? So this is a calibrated and, and um, registered already. So let's say red image takes a little bit longer, it will look like this. So, you, but you see this is the maximum, the bright from black to white, and this is auto, which is a lot harsher. So this information, but still at the bottom of the brightness scale. So this is how red layer looks after, after calibration. You also see that the image got flipped. There's some disagreement between how the image is described in the X and Y axis between iris and, <laughs> and the IP4 windows. Iris keeps the uh, different notation that the Y points downward, uh, no, upward on, in iris. Uh, and this one has downward, uh, so they're two different conventions and they, 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 they use opposite ones. But that's just simple flip later on can be corrected. So, this is the wrong orientation, of course, at Nebula, of course. Uh, and if, if you open, so there was a lot of signal in, in red, as expected. In green, when you open green, um, you know, Flame Nebula is still bright, and of course stars, but you know, horse head is barely there. And in blue, of course, uh, I think we won't see any, almost. So those, so there are five blue, five green, five red, and then I can just average them. So let's say if I want to, maybe I close those. If I want to create now a, a master red. So it's basically, let's say I can do it median combine or average combine. So if I, I take average combine and I take the red files, that's in AIP for Windows now. Okay. Sorry, cannot do that. It's giving me sometimes this. So anyway, once they are combined, that that's how they will look. <laughs> but it looks like individual image. But now, though, though it's really uh, basically they are, they are all combined uh, red and it's because it's an average of many then you, you kind of have better definition Now those red, green, and blue can then be com combined together to in a color image. So this is, let's say, color FTS image. So this in color module of uh, AIP, there is a basically join color function when you have, you know, you just use RGB or you can use also luminance. So to create luminance, you can add red, green, and blue together. Or if you prefer only to use red, I mean, it's your choice, basically. 
But basically, this is the color image created in RGB. It's LRGB in, in AIP for Windows. Um, this can be saved as, let's say, 48-bit uh, TIFF. And then you can go and, um, you know, further process it in Photoshop. Yeah. And, and maybe get something like this, yes. Okay. Now, right there, that, that sort of blue haze around the number of stars, is that desired? Here? Or is that to be eliminated? <sighs> I mean, eliminated will mean, you know, not uh, manual cropping because it's there. This is just scattering. This is the, you know, very bright star. Right. And what I'm trying to see is very faint objects and very faint gradations here. So, obviously, I have to leave. If I enhanced signal at, at the edges of, you know, IC443 and flame nebula, and, you know, there's a lot of haze actually. The whole background is luminous a little bit, the patterns there. I also will enhance that scattering around the star, so, you know, you kind of have to live with it. So yeah. scattering it's scattering. It's bluish, and actually there's a change in, in color because it's CLS filter, so, you know, there's also the, the that uh, the way the light kind of gets reflected between the layers. In spikes, you also see alternating color. So that's kind of an, uh, the alternating color, uh, color is part of the, you know, artifacts. Uh, could, could you turn and show people the screen that is washed? Yeah, out. maybe that's the way. Okay, it's bright, sorry. So that's how the image will look in the end. Mm -hmm. From that, you know, gray, greenish DSLR image in the beginning, yeah. And uh, if you remove the you know, dark current and hot pixels, then when you, you can actually go and stretch the brightness so much that you, the faint stuff comes up. If you left warm pixels because you didn't calibrate, then it won't be possible. It probably would be more, uh, more something like this AIP for Windows image. Which is okay, but you know it's a little bit harsh. No, this one, you don't have the same gradation. Yeah, it's kind of more, but it's this image which is converting to the other one. Okay, and how many? Let's see, you took about five images, right? Five times fifteen minutes. Fifteen minutes each. Okay. And what do they look like again? Uh, straight from the camera. Yeah, get close, get, get closer, get closer, and you see it's like, pfft. if you get closer, you will see that, yeah. Yeah. Kind of general reddish sheen, almost everything. Yes. But you know, that's Look this, okay, I will, you know, it's flipped, but look this and this. There is some improvement. Of course, the reality is, when you have raw image, that's where, that's where the majority of the signal I mean, that's all the information is here. That's the richest image. And then you just keep removing it. <laughs> you know, you remove dark, you remove bias, right. but the bias noise stays. That's why the bias should be, you know, master bias of combination of many. You remove thermal signal, but thermal signal stays. You remove flat, but noise, but okay, you, you, you remove flat, but the noise associated with the flight still stays in your image. So you kind of, Remove those layers, and you you have photon signal from the sky, but the noise from the other frames stayed in. So it's actually the final one is the noisiest, <laughs> in a sense. I do find it interesting, though, that in the raw <clears throat> image, there's not much of a halo around. I can't remember if that's Alma Tack, Alma Lamb, or Hawkeye. It's one of the three Orion belt stars, right? Mm -hmm. Right next to. Uh, yeah. But when you look, there's also no information. Like if you look at this area, yeah. some kind of here. There's not, you know, this just looks, you cannot see really any detail there. Yeah? But if you go to this image, and let me make it bigger. In this area, there's actually faint streaks of luminous gray and black patches. It's on the screen, no, not on, 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 on the projector. So it's scaled very strongly. 
Yeah. So when you look, all that area, which seems to be black, yeah, yeah. it's there's actually there's full of, of structure. Yeah, there's a lot of dust in that area. Yeah, and I wish I had, instead of five, I had 50 of those frames, because it, then it can be defined even better. And you can see, I mean, there's dark band actually cut in here next to the star, which, again, on the screen is hard to see, but uh, on, on the projector, but here is, you can clearly see there's a dark band going. So, because you try to, I mean, yeah, I, I agree, you know, it's visible in the original image, but you get so much more detail by processing, yeah? You can go, go deeper. The challenge, though, is to uh, keep color close, because <laughs> color is the most uh, difficult one to describe, yeah? I mean, everybody, I, my eyes see color differently than anybody else's. And then on the screen, you kind of, you are influenced by what you've seen on other pictures. I've never seen horse head nebula in full color to a telescope, because the 20 inch is still too small. <laughs> so, so you kind of assume that there is that deep red. And, but you can see that, you know, if this, you keep this red, flame nebula is a completely different color object. And I don't know how many of you tried different filters, Flame nebula basically doesn't respond to any, um, any nebula filters. It doesn't respond to ox oxygen-3. It doesn't respond to hydrogen beta. It's a weird object. Well, it's, a reflection. It must be a reflection. it's probably a reflect combination, reflection, and emission. And the combination is such that you never, you know, if you lose one uh, through the oxygen-3, maybe emission part gets stronger, but you lose reflection as a combination of two. And so it's, it's a weird one. To try to make the colors stronger. Right now, you've just kept authenticity in the colors. Uh, well, no. I mean, when the moment you go to the final image, like this one, the, I mean, the way I balance colors, I take green and red, master green, uh, you know, fits fire once it's got all combined, and green uh, and red and blue. Scale them from so the zero is let's say. 0.1% of pixels will be black. I scale, I scale them linearly, so they kind of uh, they have a similar range, and that's what I use to combine the color. And that gets you close, and then you have to probably change it a little bit. So that may have, that may have increased some of the bluish around the yes. stars, because it wasn't much elsewhere, so that came up. With yes, it. because I wanted also to see that blue reflection nebula right. here, and you know, the blue component in that emission patch. So, but the uh, around the bright star may have come from But also the, 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 the low end of the brightness, I amplified many times. So like original one was kind of linear, and then I made a hump like this. Oh, so everything which was, and that's to basically bring out the very faint detail in this area, like, you know, faint red glow here, and also the dark and bright gray patches in this part. So you kind of play with the image. And the, I always tell, if you process the image properly, there shouldn't be any black sky in it, because sky is never black. It's always, there's always signal. There's so much structure hiding in the darkness, in the shadows, that you would like to bring it. And you know, it, of course, now, because that's the least defined part of your image, they will, it will be noisy. If you look at this image on the screen here, you'll see there's quite a, little bit, quite a bit of variation, noise in those parts. Because you, can, you have to you know, expose for 100 hours, probably, to get it well defined. And, but then there will be something fainter there always. Yeah? So that's what you want to, to bring. If, so the image should never be black sky. I, when I see the image which is processed and there's a black sky in it, I say that's because people are hiding. They're hiding that they didn't calibrate it correctly <laughs> because that means they couldn't get the flat, dark gray across the frame. And it's okay. I mean, if you are looking just at the star clusters or whatever, you know, it, it, it's one way. But if you, you know, if we can strive to get it a little bit better, like, and the calibration is the clue to it. If calibration is done properly, then you can actually get the image which has a dark gray background and stuff kind of picking out of it here and there. 
you know, magnitude 18 galaxies of faint asteroids moving in the background. They are not just dismissed into darkness in the black. Given how, you, how careful you are with the, uh, the calibrations, have you ever tried to uh, convert some of the stars into their B magnitudes and compare it to in a standard field? You, you to can, see you, how well they match? You can do that. It's the thing is, of course, you would have to acquire the image through photometric filters. Because here there's CLS, so it's already throws the, you know, the brightness. So okay. the V may be pretty close. Yeah, I mean, V is basically green, and CLS lets cyan part and red. The red, green is actually blocked. So you, you probably get close enough, but you know, it won't be like photometric analysis. I generally, what, when I look at it, the brighter star looks brighter than the image. <laughs> so it, it, it keeps the relation to some extent, but it, it's not precise. In AIP for Windows, can you use or generate and then use masks? Yes. In other software packages, you can generate a star mask and say, just pick out all the bright stars. Yes. And then, before you go to stretch, mask the stars. And it basically says, don't stretch the stars, just stretch the background. Yes, you can. You can do different things, uh, but you know. Of course, generating if you mass is the hard part. you stretch, but if you stretch your background to be brighter than your stars, <laughs> well, what the hell then happens? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's easy. To, I, I I prefer to keep it kind of all in a relation, so you kind of stretch. But you know, you you you, you basically if you have linear response and now now you kind of made it like this, the stars are usually in this part. They're not affected so much. Faint stars will go up. Yeah, bright stars will stay. But the scattering halo around being faint will get enhanced, yeah. But, you know, uh, but I show you something about the masks, yeah. So this is the one, if I have it, where do I have it? Okay, I have to go to the desktop. Because uh, there's one and other, other use of masks, or kind of masks, which I, I have a particular image, which, where did I put it, of course, here. Look at the angle. Some of the, some of the image is taken, but this is one in particular, which I think, this is Orion Nebula, and uh, for this, I used, in AIP, kind of the function similar to masks. Because Orion Nebula has such a tremendous range of brightnesses. It's almost impossible to capture. I mean, you want, if you take one second exposure, then trapezium region will be nice, and you see color and structure, but nothing else will be visible, just that part. So, and when you take, you know, 15 minute exposure, this part will be visible, but this will be just a white blob. So one way to do, this image was actually done, it's a, whatever, kind of a high dynamic range image. When I combine six second, one minute, and 15 minute exposures together. Mm -hmm. And the idea was such that if you take 15 minute exposure, and you know, now you have this, you know, arms, and this is completely saturated. Then you look, in AIP you say anything above, you know, 60,000, <laughs> whatever, <laughs> value, you, you replace with blackness. Yeah? Then you take six minute exposure, process it, and isolate exactly the same region and put it in place. But you don't put it in place, you add it on top plus whatever, plus those 65,000 in the beginning. So you get some more structure here. But there will be again saturated region, which now you replaced you, with blackness first, then add, 60, you know, then add another image to it. Now you have something like your range of brightnesses in TIFF file, in FITS file is from zero to 300,000 because you kind of multiply it, but then you can shrink it and process together. So, I wish I had, you know, like half second exposure actually, because the trapezium is still, uh, still bright. So you have these masking overlays. I'm masking, masking the saturated area and then replacing 
adding on top of it something, and another one, and another one, and another one. So we're just using small part. It's basically the area around the trapezium at the centers of the bright stars. Those blobs, actually, that's what's affected. But it can, it can be, it can be done, done that way. So that's basically it in a, in a very short. <laughs> Kept you too long, anyway. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you very much for patience. <laughs> but please, if you, if you have any questions, or you know. I think AIP for Windows, which is a book and software, I think the book, the book part will let you do many more things. This is, they don't, it's, they, they don't really write too much about the SLR, but you know, general CCD uh, imaging. AIP for Windows, yeah. AIP. AIP. Yeah. It's $99, and you get software, which... And what what uh, software package? Is it, they have their own software? Yes. AIP for Windows. AIP for Windows. But the book is not dependent on software. Book doesn't describe...